Good morning. I'm Reverend David Schwartz, and it's good to be with you in worship today. This is not the service I had planned to lead, but the world around us demands it right now. Since we gathered last Sunday, the murder of George Floyd and the widening circle of protest across this country remind us that silence is complicity. We need to speak. We gather as a church to mourn and to celebrate. We gather as a church, whether it's online or in person, to place on the altar the fullness of our lives, the fullness of humanity. We gather as a church to tell the truth even when it's hard. The injustice can't go unanswered and unsaid. In this service, we'll speak to the brutal reality of racial violence and injustice. This is a space of resolution and of lamentation. This is a service to make space for our grief, our anger, our hopelessness, and our resolve. We're not here to give the answers. We're not here for a resolution. We're not gathered to tie everything together. And we are not gathered to make ourselves feel so good about how much we're doing. We're gathered this morning to hold close the fullness of life. We're gathered this morning to break open our hearts to the reality of a broken nation. And to the reality of a love and a solidarity that heals. We gather for this work because this is who we are. Welcome, then, to the Beverly Unitarian Church online worship. I'm so glad to be with you this morning, even amongst everything. We'll be joined later in the service by my wife, the Reverend Terry Schwartz, to share the sermon with me this week. We'll be joined by our own members and musicians, and by musicians from across the country. We are a Unitarian Universalist congregation of children, youth, and adults of many races, of many faiths, of many identities, of many genders and sexual orientations, of all different abilities and educations and incomes and traditions. Here we celebrate a diversity of beliefs. We strive to make space for more. This church is a plural church, not a singular one. Whatever your past was like, whatever your present is like right now, we invite you to walk toward the future with us, come together. Like other Unitarian Universalist congregations, we affirm seven principles, not doctrines or dogmas, but statements of beliefs and values, really, of values shared among us. We especially welcome visitors, and I hope you'll stay if you're joining us live on Sunday morning, stay for coffee hour after the service. There's a link that'll be shared in chat. Beverly folks, you should have received that link already. We look forward to the day, visitors, when we'll be able to meet you in person. You belong here, all of you. All of you is sacred. Throughout today's service, you can interact with each other in the live comment feed happening alongside the video. Log into your YouTube account or create one to leave comments, reactions, to share prayer requests, candles of joy and of concern later in the service. I invite you now to settle into this present moment, to arrive, to let yourself arrive, to be here now and enter into this service together. Circle round for freedom, circle round for peace, for all of us imprisoned, circle for release, circle for the planet, circle for its all, 
For the children of our children, keep the circle whole. Circle round for freedom. Circle round for peace. For Each week we covenant with each other in this congregation. We covenant with each other. I'll lead you in it in just a moment, but a covenant means we make promises to each other about how we're going to be in the world, who we're going to be in the world. We promise each other what we're about and how we're going to do it. And some weeks, the words of that covenant are comfortable, nice, platitudes and some weeks we don't think too much about them and some weeks our covenant is an uncomfortable call that we are falling short of we say love is the spirit of this church and service is its law this is our great covenant to dwell together in peace. That doesn't mean the absence of conflict merely, but the presence of justice. That's what peace really is. Peace, dwelling together in peace, it doesn't mean mere politeness. Peace does not mean tolerance of intolerance. Peace means justice. Peace is not about comfort. Peace is not about contentment. Peace is not the absence of tension, but the presence of justice. That's the promise we're making to each other, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love. To seek the truth in love. Not to find, not to find the truth definitively, to seek the truth in love, not to find one singular, exact, precise, defining belief about the nature of race or racism or white supremacy. We don't gather to find the right analysis that gets it exactly correct, perfectly. We don't gather so that we all can use exactly the same vocabulary to talk about the same things. In the end, that practice, that work, that seeking all to get it right is just about me or you. It's not about us. 
We seek the truth in love. That doesn't mean we wait to do anything in the world until we've got it all. Love means tough love, too. It means saying what is difficult and true. It means moving forward all together. It means calling out what isn't true, to seek the truth in love and to help one another, to help one another. Our loyalty as human beings is to humanity. Our loyalty as members of this congregation is not merely to the other members of this congregation, is not merely to the people watching this video, is not to the people who gather physically in the church, is not to our block, our neighborhood, our city, or our nation. Our loyalty is to humanity. It's to the living itself. That means we're called, each of us and all of us, to help one another. The task is enormous and unending. The promises we make are promises we will fall short of. And nonetheless, we covenant each week to them. I light our chalice this week, simple flame. For those promises that we make, that commitment we make that pulls us out of and beyond ourselves. Will you join me in saying together the words of our covenant? Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Friends, I invite you in the chat to warmly greet those who've gathered together this morning, remembering that the chat is public. This is called What to Tell the Children by the poet Rachel Kahn. What to Tell the Children, November 23rd, 2016, the day before Mike Brown's killer walked free. Tell them that this is the great awakening. Tell them that we humans have made some huge mistakes and that's how we now find ourselves in this tenuous place. Teach them that hate is poison. Teach them that love is the remedy, that it's better to be readied for what comes next, even if the revelation is painful. Tell them that this is the paradigm shift, that the old is collapsing in on itself, that this death rattle is simply a temper tantrum, the last gasp of dying Colossus. Remind them of how they get wild when they are most 
tired and then pass out. That's what this is about. That's what's happening to a decrepit and ineffective empire. Tell them that everything is not okay. And knowing that is okay. Tell them that pretending that what is unacceptable is fine is what got us to this sick and dysfunctional spot on the timeline. Apologize for any prior attempt to teach them denial. Tell them you were blinded by desire for comfortable numbness. Express you had the best intentions, that you were working within a broken system where few benefited at the expense of the many, that you laid low. Tell them you kept to the status quo. Tell them you obediently played your role, but now those days are over because you know better. Tell them that they have no responsibility to follow someone solely based on a title. Teach them to practice discernment. Tell them authority and respect must be earned. They're not inherently deserved. Tell them there are good people and bad people from every background and ethnicity and belief system that they must align themselves with kindness. That there is no more time for divisiveness. You tell them that just because something is legal, that doesn't mean it's right. You tell them to stand up and fight. Remind them of all the lawful atrocities committed in the sick and twisted history of this violent country, that Rosa Parks righteously broke a law and the world took notice, that Harriet Tubman is our modern-day Moses, that women would not be allowed to vote, and no one would have proposed another notion if blessed rebels hadn't taken a stand. Tell them, Love will win this war. But only if we remember that love is not just one unending cuddle puddle, but fierce as a mother bear protecting her cubs. Tell them that although this existence is damaged beyond repair, they must not despair. There is possibility, and we will willingly and willfully open ourselves to new ways of being because the old way is not working, never worked, and the world deserves better, and we're worth it. Tell them they are not free. While another suffers under enslavement, tell them they are not free. While another suffers under enslavement, tell them we are all limbs on one body. And we cannot chop off our own arm without deep suffering. Teach them humility, but also to relearn to trust their intuition and beg their forgiveness for unintentionally misleading them previously. Tell them their gifts are useful. Tell them they are beautiful. Tell them they are the truth. Amen. We can go jogging. We can relax and be safe in the comfort of our own homes. We can have a cell phone. We can play loud music. We can sell CDs. We can ask for help after being in a car crash. We can sleep. We can walk home from the store. We can leave a party to get to safety. We can go to church. We can ask a cop a question. We can hold a hairbrush while leaving our own bachelor party. We can party on New Year's. We can get a normal traffic ticket. We can play in the park. We can lawfully carry a weapon. We can break down on a public road with car problems. We can shop at Walmart.
We can have a disabled vehicle. We can read a book in our own car. Our 10 year olds can walk with their grandparents. We can decorate for a party. And we can walk home in a hoodie with Skittles. We can cash our check in peace. We can take out our wallet. We can live. We can breathe. We can breathe. We can breathe. We can breathe. As members of Beverly Unitarian Church, we say with one voice. We say with one voice. We can do all this because we are white. Because we are white. Because we are white. And they were not. And they were not. And, and they, they were, were not. not. As members of Beverly Unitarian Church, we say with one voice. One, one voice. voice. One voice. One voice. Black lives matter. 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 I'm a young black man doing all that I can to stay. Oh, but when I look around and I see what's being done to my kind every day, I'm being hard to this prey. My people don't want no trouble. We've had enough struggle. I just want to live. God protect me. I just want to live. I just want to live. Friends, will you take a breath with me? And another. I invite you into a spirit of prayer and meditation to be grounded where you are, to be where you are, to be here now. Our words for meditation are from my colleague, Kate Tucker, called Dear Mr. Floyd. Dear Mr. Floyd, in pandemic times, we learned that breath is everything. Look what we'll risk to keep it flowing in and out of our lungs, to feel it cool the nostrils, to feel the breastbone rise, to trust how it finds its way and feeds the blood. In pandemic times, we see how the world goes to work for a simple breath, giving up livelihoods, bringing children home from school to protect this elementary act, sees the nurses in shields like warriors, sees mask makers at their sewing machines intent over scraps of fabric, sees factories reap tool to make machines that push air through our windpipes so we can sing the song of life. Sees distilleries turn spirits into sanitizer to make our hands clean, but our hands are not clean, Mr. Floyd, because of the other virus, the contaminant which is our pre-existing condition and causes us to step away from each other for centuries. Now your town is on fire, and you lie still on the pavement. See how our tears fall on our masks. See how our masks fall from our faces. See the fabric Unravel, Mr. Floyd, rise, please rise like the smoke. Do not refuse to haunt us. Do not refuse to haunt us. Or how will we remember what we learn and forget? Breath is not cheap. 
Can you take a breath with me? And another. Each week in our community, we light candles, candles of joy and candles of sorrow. Each week in our community, we reaffirm this commitment that we don't have to go through life alone, that we're not fundamentally isolated, but we can trust and place our lives into each other's hands. We do that when we gather in person each by lighting candles and the common flame and heat and light and warmth is the light and the warmth also of our community. These days, that shame sharing happens here online. And I invite you now in the chat to share the names of anyone you wish to lift up in the love of this community, to share the joys that lift you up and the burdens and the sorrow that wears you down. I invite you in the chat to share your lives and your joys and your sorrows with each other or to raise two fingers in silence by typing in I, I so that we know and see you. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle round to tend the fire. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time now. It is time now that we thrive. It is time we lead ourselves into the well. It is time now. And what a time to be alive in this great turning. We shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in Love. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle round to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time now, it is time now that we thrive. It is time we lead ourselves into the well. It is time now, and what a time to be alive. In this great turning we shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle round to tend these fires. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth. It is time now, it is time now that we thrive. It is time we lead ourselves into the well. It is time now. And what a time to be alive in this great turning. We shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. In this great turning, we shall learn to lead in love. 
In this great turning we shall learn to leave in love. What is there new to say that has not already been said? What were we not already told by the murders of Mike Brown, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray, Eric Garner, Sandra Bland? What's the word that hasn't yet been spoken? We lived in Minneapolis, Terry and I, when our kids were small. For three years, we lived around the corner from the intersection where Floyd George was murdered on Monday. Every workday, I got on the number five bus right there, 38th and Chicago in Minneapolis. I know that intersection. I know that convenience store. I know that gas station. I know the real estate ads on the bus stop benches. Our house was around the corner. Our house was around the corner, and we never lived in the Minneapolis where Floyd George was murdered. My black neighbors and I lived on the same block, but we did not live in the same city. That's Chicago, too. My black neighbors and I live in the same building, and we do not live in the same city. Minneapolis is America. Chicago is America. In Hyde Park, in Beverly, in a scattering of other neighborhoods around Chicago and around the country, good, liberal, progressive white folks talk about integration, but we do not yet live in the same country as our black neighbors. When I lived in South Minneapolis, the police were there to protect people who looked like me from people who looked like them. Here's the number of times I got hassled by a cop in Minneapolis. Zero. In seven years. Zero. I mean, getting off the bus at 38th in Chicago at midnight and the patrol cars never even slowed down. I mean, rolling through stop signs in my own car in front of the cops who didn't even look up to shake their head at me. I mean, jaywalking, downtown, Nicollet Mall, the cops call out two black men and didn't even notice me not break stride across the street. Here's the number of times I got hassled by a cop in Minneapolis. Zero. The rules for white America and the rules for black America are not the same. I live three blocks from where Floyd George was murdered. I waited for the bus on the patch of concrete where he died. And he and I never lived in the same city. What is the word for kind expressions of sympathy with no action. What's the word when you acknowledge the hurt and the pain is real and do nothing about it? What's the word when your answer to a murder is to show your resume of who you've supported and when? We Unitarian Universalists have a long history of fighting for racial justice, and we Unitarian Universalists have an even longer history of shaking our heads sadly and wiping our hands clean from the blood that is on them. God knows I detest slavery, wrote the Unitarian president, Millard Fillmore. God knows I detest slavery, but we must endure it and give it such protection as is guaranteed by the Constitution till we can get rid of it. He's one of us. He is deep 
in the long progressive tradition of a heart in the right place, a person who cared, who wept surely and worried and did nothing. In his last breaths, Floyd George said, my stomach hurts, my neck hurts, everything hurts, I need some water or something, please, please, I can't breathe, officer, I can't breathe, they're gonna kill me, and they did. Will we, too, do nothing? Will we, too, shake our heads and wash our hands? Will we, too, take our place in the long history and tradition of good progressives who shook their heads and walked past the Samaritan dying in front of us, will we do nothing? Will we too do nothing? We are in the midst of a pandemic, of a contagious and often deadly virus that cuts off the breath that isolates and kills. And it kills people of color disproportionately because of another virus. We have been in an epidemic, a virus of white supremacy for 400 years. Our country was founded on land theft, rape, and slavery. This virus is even more contagious and deadly and is transmitted through generations, tweets, threats, state-sanctioned violence that cuts off the breath, that isolates, that kills people of color. And when people of color stand up, they are condemned to scrutiny, condemnation, arrest, and often condemned to death. Zokar Sarnev blew up the Boston Marathon. James Holmes shot up a Colorado theater. Dylan Roof committed a terrorist attack at a Charleston church, coldly executing nine black people as they worshiped. Each of these killers was safely taken into custody. In 2018, Philadelphia Eagles fans tore up their city, looting, flipping cars, and starting fires after a Super Bowl win. Trump did not threaten them. Shall we talk about looting? Looting is the theft of native lands. Looting is what's inside the Oriental Institute down the street. Looting is billionaire wealth growing 15% just since the beginning of the pandemic. In the fierce unrest and in our quiet sorrow, what words then do we speak? What then shall we do? There are some things that aren't helpful. There are seductive diversions at best idolatry at worst. Shall we argue more over the right name by which to call a racist system of white supremacy? Shall we make a motion? Shall we seek salvation by right analysis? Shall we seek redemption by committee meeting? Shall we proclaim our innocence? Proclaim our expertise? Shall we disavow broken windows instead of broken bodies? 
Shall we change the channel? Shall we repeat again the old platitudes? We say, we hear, I'm so sad. I majored in black studies. I took a class on anti-racism. I fought in the civil rights movement. Each of these statements starts with the same word, I. They do not address systemic racism and white supremacy, nor the personal actions that led to racist violence. They do not focus on the person who experienced the violence. They do not focus on the victims of murder. They do not focus on the families of those who were murdered. They do not focus on the experiences and discrimination and fear that black and brown people face every single day. They do not speak of the woman who is afraid when her husband leaves the house for work. They do not speak of the child who is afraid when their father leaves the house to jog. They do not speak of the teenager who is afraid to go to the park the child who is afraid to play. Feminist writer and activist Katie Anthony says we could say this instead. I'm sorry. I see you. It's awful. Does that feel insufficient? She asks. It's because it is. But we don't have to stop there. Neighbors in Minneapolis lined up grocery bags on the street for anyone who needs them. People across the country joined in protest. Minneapolis and New York City bus drivers refused to transport protesters to jail to ensure their labor was not used to shut down calls for justice. Oh, what then shall we do? Fight for criminal justice reform. Fight for income inequality. Fight for universal health care. Fight for free education. Fight for higher taxes on the 1%. Fight for all the things that would make rioting unnecessary. We covenant that love is the spirit of this church that is tough love, love that acts, love that calls one another to be accountable. We say service is our prayer. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, no justice, no peace, seek justice. To seek the truth and love, Truth about ourselves, truth in the news, truth in history, in love, a tough love, a love of fierce unrest. And to help one another, we covenant. And by one another at our best, we mean not merely our friends nor social clubs, but also those outside of our kin outside of our comfort, outside of our privilege, outside of our church walls. And then justice shall roll on like a river and righteousness an ever flowing stream. May it be so and amen. We shall be known by the company we keep, by the ones who circle around to tend these vines. We shall be known by the ones who sow and reap the seeds of change alive from deep within the earth.
this great turning we shall learn to lead in love.